there, everyone, and welcome to this latest Premier Sports Network webinar. My name is Adam Leventhal, longtime partner of Premier Sports Network, and it's really great to uh, be doing one of these once again. The title of this webinar is the official match ball with integrated tracking sensor. What do they deliver that no other technology can? And as you can see, I am joined by two perfectly well-dressed gentlemen who are st stood in front of wonderful backdrops and we are ready to get stuck in to this topic. Uh, Nicholas Evans and Maximilian Schmidt. Uh, Maximilian Schmidt is the CRO and global sports lead at Connexon and Nicholas Evans who's the head of football research and standards at FIFA. Gentlemen, uh, welcome on board. I'm really looking forward to getting stuck into this. Uh, and Nicholas, I'll start with you, if I may, just to give a brief introduction as to what that role, that big chunky title that you have entails, especially in this, in this fittingly, this sphere. Yeah, I appreciate the, um, the, the few thoughts you put into the effort for my background there. Um, so I think the, uh, the key to me is not to have innovation and technology in every possible uh, title. So I purposely went down the road of research and standards, um, which is really the whole idea of looking at a value chain. Uh, I like to think of it as, as the problem solving value chain. You actually identify what is the issue that you're trying to, to get um, an, an answer to. Uh, and then by research, by knowledge creation, partnering with, you know, industry, with uh, with other stakeholders, football stakeholders, researchers, you then come to a solution. And for that solution to be globally usable, you need to put a standard in place. And as FIFA, obviously, as the governing body, um, we do that. And so that's uh, not what I like to think I do. <laughs> that's what I have to do on a, on a daily basis and really across uh, technology, football equipment, um, uh, playing surfaces, so really all the, all the different areas. But clearly the, the, the growing sort of um, impetus is, is within technologies, within in-game technologies, officiating, fan technologies, um, which is why I think uh, we're uh, another kind of milestone of this area today. And Maximilian, just a, a brief on, on your role, a, a bit of background on Connexon as well. Hi, um, hi there, I'm Maximilian. I'm one of the co-founders also of Connexon Sports. Uh, we established our business in 2014 uh, back in Munich, uh, now our global operating tech company with offices in Chicago and Munich. And uh, our mission at Connexon is to empower the global world of sports with real-time insights on performance to ideally help them to reach the next level, what that ever means for coaches, uh, the staff, the players, uh, or the fans that enjoy our beautiful uh, sports, whatever they like. It's not only football that we care about, but it's definitely one of our key pillars. We also work in basketball, handball, hockey, or American football. And uh, we work globally with more than 200 teams, uh, a handful of leagues, and that use technology and innovation to enhance the product that they're having, um, to enhance the product of the, of the sport. And you're speaking to us from, from Malaga right now, where, there, where there's sort of a, a nice, quiet period where some of this testing can go on with, with one of the other sports aside from, from football, right? Yeah, off-season for many sports is always a great time to engage with leagues and federations because they have actually the mind and the focus to think about long-term projects. Um, here we are with the MBPA, the Player Association from, uh, from the biggest league in basketball, uh, thinking about how can technology help them to reach the next level. And they invited uh, tech vendors coming over to Malaga where they have like a workout ses session in off season and discuss what could be done in the future uh, to help athletes also to get more insights on their performance and how to educate them to, to become a better athlete along their career. So, for people watching, Connexon are the preferred partner for electronic performance and tracking systems. And, and Nicholas, what I wanted to ask you was, why have FIFA partnered with Connexon? Just give us a bit of a background to this to this link, because it is it's groundbreaking, essentially, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so I'll be very precise. We call it the FIFA preferred provider for electronic performance and tracking systems. And if we want to be even even worse, it's then also for live player and ball tracking. And I think in all of that sort of lie. Um, lie the major clues. So we started with uh, investigating this essentially, I think it goes back to sort of 2012, 13, when the, the first players, uh, notable players were wearing GPS units in football. And the question sort of came as, are they allowed to do that? What 
does it actually mean? What good does it do for the game? And so around the time 2015, 16, we started actually investigating and saying, okay, rather than just forbidding or, or thinking about forbidding, let's proactively understand what good they could do for the game. Um, and that's where, what I was saying earlier, one of the one of the standards eventually got put in place over a couple of years where testing happens to look at the validity, the accuracy of the data that we're getting out of it. Um, and, we, and we've seen that journey evolve. And I think during that time, uh, Maximilian referred to the sort of 2014 start date, uh, which coincided very much with when we um, when we got interested in it. Uh, we sort of grew, obviously, relationships with all of the, the, the vendors out there, all of the companies out there. But I think there was a, a sort of um, like likeness in, in, in the mindset to try and go that further step and to try and uh, try new things. And probably one of one of the themes that I'll refer to a bit more is also the, the dare to fail. So it's this opportunity to look, let, let's actually have a look. No one's tried it before. Let, let's see what it do. And I think that's where um, in Kinexon we found a, a good um partner in crime, so to speak, which is not to say we'd, we'd not, we're not working with other companies as well. But I think this groundbreaking part was specifically um, that we saw the, the total solution and the willingness um, on, on behalf of the company to really, with us, look at these new, uh, new outlets, knowing very well that nothing could come of it. And I think that that's something that, that's been a, a bit of a, a unique situation for us. So Maximilian, obviously, it's, it's great to have this partnership um, with FIFA, um, just give us for for people that are that haven't watched the news recently, for example, or have no idea whatsoever about what we're talking about here. Um, and I'm not far away from that. I'm a, I'm I'm naive in many things, but I, I'm really looking forward to this whole partnership. How does the ball tracking by Connexon actually work? Good point. I think coming back to the partnership with Nicholas, I think as a, as a company, you always select your partners very wisely because you only have so many resources. And we found mutual interest in being innovative back then. And we started with informal uh, projects. And then in the last couple of years, it got more formalized because we said, yes, this is the right partner that we work with, that we can learn off what are the key requirements, what are the developments that we have to do. And one of the things that we early on recognize in the market that there are already a lot of great technologies out there to measure and analyze player performance. Mm -hmm. But uh, the ball was always kind of the missing piece to fully understand what's going on, to get context into the performance analysis. That's why we uh, early on started to develop a solution that can also track not only the players, but also the ball. And our technology is based on a, a small variable that we place together with our partners, the ball manufacturer inside the ball, in the way that players cannot recognize the difference. And inside of the ball, the sensor is capable of getting position of the ball on the pitch, uh, detecting every ball movement in three dimensions and uh, analyzing uh, every ball touch and for, for that purpose, then transmitting it in real time to a system that is set up around the pitch uh, to further analyze it and get insights that you couldn't have before, such as ball speed and ball spin, a ball touch and if you combine it with player data you get like actually football performance uh, insights and then nicholas from from your point of view a lot of people will have seen that this is going to be used for the first time at, at the world cup and it has yes uh, a tracking side of it in terms of of performance but also officiating as well just give us the background to to that big step because it's it's the one that's getting getting everyone excited because it may well lead to those those funny lines from shoulders not having to be drawn too much anymore don't know what you mean um <laughs> so the the whole conversation has to go back a step and saying it's not that we just one day woke up and thought hey what can we do with this ball so it's a process that, that goes back to to a really thorough debrief and sort of um, you know audit of, of what happened at the World Cup in Russia, where overall we were very happy with a lot of things, but then um, the sort of key areas around official match data, which teams were not overly happy with, um, and then one of the uh, perceived areas of improved uh, opportunity uh, was the, uh, the the speed of the decision making um, for offside. And so around 2019, we, we sat down with the whole industry, with all of the tracking providers, player, ball, et cetera, and say, do you believe that the leaps that you're making in this area could help us in an officiating capacity? And so we, we looked at specifically from an optical perspective, the skeletal tracking, which you would have then also seen, um, but then also uh, 
figured that one of the most critical components for that is is the moment the ball is played and i really don't want to bore anyone with sort of uh, the, the technicalities but that moment is very very short and if we look at pictures and again everyone who's sort of followed uh, i guess also the british media in this in this case um will have would have seen a lot of these controversies and so we were just having that conversation again as i mentioned to say can this device ball be used to help us improve the detection of that kick point so it's a very very particular use case and i think we we went down that route because we thought we could get a higher resolution from this ball than we could from from um the the television uh, images and we've done now three years of testing and so we're confident um and uh, that's a dangerous thing to say confident that it will add the value that, that we're hoping to get from it but this is obviously a very very specific use case that we've gone into um, that i wouldn't sort of want to uh, uh, inflict on anyone else who hasn't gone down that same sort of thought process and um, and looked at it so we we believe that it can add value in that data source by just adding the granularity that, that we're looking for from an officiating perspective but again that that's as a consequence of us seeing the the improvements in the live player and the live ball tracking um as as mentioned nicholas has obviously mentioned it there that this is a long process it's not like it's being tried out for the first time and we we cross our fingers and, and hope that it's going to work at the world cup it's been a through a, a you know a stringent process of testing maximilian can you just give us an insight into what what has been done and also the knowledge that you have brought in from from other sports into that sort of into that confidence now that you can you can roll it out at the world cup Absolutely. I think Kinexon always started with uh, use cases like performance analysis and how we can use those insights we get from technology to better understand the game from a coaching perspective, from a performance analysis, match analysis or fan engagement perspective. We are not an expert actually in officiating technology. So for us, we had already like a system in place that was capable of tracking a ball. Uh, with a different ball provider that we worked uh, already like for the last uh, six years, uh, Select Derby Star. And we have deployed the technology also in handball. Uh, where Select is a very strong brand. So we had already the capability of getting real-time insights directly out of the ball and use that for different use cases. But we were not aware of what are the specific requirements for FIFA to actually help the officiating process, right? In terms of how fast do we get the information to a central system like a VAR system? How precise has it to be? How high the update rate has to be? And how do we synchronize our system with the existing systems that FIFA has already in place? And that integration part uh, is harder than we thought. That why, that's why it took us a couple of years to get there. But with the help of the team of Nicholas, uh, we finally got to the point and now I'm really curious to see how much we can really actually improve the fan experience by ideally better and faster decision making. And Nicholas, presumably, I mean, you know, we are moving forward from from the from the pandemic. I know there is still concerns all around the world about COVID nineteen and things like that. But but getting this ready for this time to be able to roll out at, at Qatar twenty twenty two must have had a few bumps in the road along the way, simply because of you know being able to have close contact here and there to actually do this testing yeah i think that's true for for a lot of things and uh probably teams were as much affected uh in in, in a lot of way i think obviously global um supply chains just the production uh, yeah. the factories where where these these balls are produced uh, was was one element but yeah i mean for me the 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 key is as i said earlier it's trial and error and for trial and error you need experimental trials that means going into stadiums you know getting out there um we had slightly less glamorous days with uh, you know five six people for hours trying to get offside situations but as i said that that's just one one use case that that we were looking at where you know it didn't help the pandemic uh, having to get into stadiums follow protocols you know just for us even uh, we're based here in switzerland to get into germany uh, just to enter the country and then what all the documents you have to fill out yeah so that that was an added um, added challenge um but as, ha having said that i think you know we, we had a clear objective we knew what we were trying to achieve and therefore um, that that really helped us also um, work down that that sheet. We're not we weren't guessing in the dark. For us, I said, um, failure was always an option. Uh, and I don't like to use the word failure, but I said it, it's trial and error. So it was always an option that at some point we would come down the road and say, for the purpose that we're looking at, this doesn't work. Um, and I think that's why it's also uh, for me. I'm happy to see that 
we we found something, but obviously going forward, that is a common conversation that will need to be had. It's like, okay, how many other use cases can be um, can be solved with this? And I think that the pandemic probably actually highlighted some of those that this could be useful for uh, due to uh, the the necessity to be remote, right? Be that uh, scouting and all these things we might get into in a moment. So mm-hmm. yes, it for sure made it harder, but uh, probably you know as, as much from a from a production perspective as as being able to get people on site um and just the unknown if you told me okay you've got to wait an hour, a year and a half and then you go for it yeah it's just we didn't know when this was going to stop and how it was going to stop and you know we did tournaments in the bubble uh where people couldn't move the ball from the pitch to where it needed to to be so yeah there's uh definitely bumps in the road there but as i said i think uh probably in the in the larger scale of things still rather fortunate to be able to go ahead and do this. Nicholas I'll ask you about the the fortuitous I suppose timing of of the World Cup um, with the potential of this being rolled out maybe if it goes if it goes well as I'm sure it will you know for other major leagues around around the world um, in, a, in a moment's time I'll ask you about that but Maximilian from, from your point of view let's move away from the officiating side of things and you know Focus on what else comes from this this data gathering that is coming from from the central thing of football, the the football. What what else does it offer? What else can can clubs, can leagues, can um, well anyone, I suppose, any fan watching? What what is the the potential of having this technology now as part of the beautiful game? We don't know yet what's the potential. I think that's the beauty about it. Um, there might be various applications that we haven't even thought about. Uh, but three main applications uh, are obviously uh, officiating, as FIFA made out uh, their mind about that. Um, performance analysis, like helping the coach and, and the team to improve overall performance. that can be used in practice and in match matches. And the third pillar then would be fan engagement. Like how can we tell new stories with uh, the information that we get uh, from the ball uh, combined with other uh, data sources like player tracking. These are the main three areas that uh, that we are engaging with, and performance analysis and fan engagement already has been in, in place with ball tracker tracking in other leagues. Right, we we work with a couple of Bundesliga teams in practice, uh, that were pioneers in that that aspect, like uh, Marcel Daum at Bayern or Leverkusen. They uh, used the balls mainly in practice uh, to replicate the uh, playing philosophy of the head coach. And, and try to prepare the best possible way for the next uh, match day. Um, we see it used in academies. Um, we use it for player development. You want to uh, implement like uh, how the players improve in terms of ball handling, uh, ball control, um, how you can implement like a holistic approach as a team. You want to start with your U14, U16 to already kind of work on what's the uh, philosophy, how we want to play as a club. Uh, and therefore, it can be used. It can be used in in games. And uh, there we have the example of, of handball, where you have like the real time data in the German handball league. Uh, every match is equipped with player and ball tracking. You can use it for match analysis and, and and see like specific trends that you might not be able to see purely based on video. But you get like actually insights from the ball on the ball movement on the speed uh, of the game, and that it can be used for and fan engagement. Uh, we also have a couple of examples. Where it's already deployed, like for sponsorship opportunities. Um, again, like the, the German Handball League, they found a great partner with a German uh, retail bank, online bank, uh, that is the main data partner for them. And they use it to activate that sponsorship and, and tell stories about uh, the most valuable player and, and using the data to describe that, uh, using it to enhance highlight clips, using it to enhance the sky broadcasting of Handball and, uh, and illustrating how fast uh, a player was throwing the ball on the goal and showing like a map on the goal where it was placed and where the goalie maybe has the strengths and weaknesses. So those are use cases that we are already working on. And we are very confident that this becomes more like a standard in the future. Um, that people will engage it more and more. And we are there to be the partner of, of every league that wants to engage with that and help them how it can be applied to their unique ecosystem that they're in and what is their biggest need. Because obviously, you know, the manipulation of the ball in, in football, it's not just simply just kicking it with with your toe in one direction. That the manipulation, the spin, the angle, the the curl, keeping the ball still in the air, and things like that. I suppose it opens up a whole um, a whole sort of 
this huge area of data that can really sort of add to a it's a data driven sport now isn't it you know people at home expect to know everything about it so i suppose it's 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 moved on even though i'm sure ball speed will be a big part of it it's moved on from the days where maybe people were watching in the uk they were watching monday night football and and everyone was getting a buzz out of seeing how fast those shots were um there is so much more that can be offered uh, nicholas from your point of view obviously it's being used primarily from an officiating point of view um at the world cup is there are there plans to sort of display any more data that is coming from from the ball tracking or is it simply going to be officiating for now again kind of coming to the to the, the journey that we had it's this is the solution that we've we've envisaged and i think um maximilian touched on the point of saying there are many other opportunities yeah now my role stops in a way uh, with solving the problem that's been put in front of me and mm. I, I can obviously see the potential and I think you've mentioned a lot of a uh, lot of incredible things um, but what we can generally see is what we're going in the direction of digitization I think we, we've helped uh, in that sense for the officiating side show that you can use data uh, to make those decisions so we're going from a purely visual I won't say analog process but essentially that's what it was um, mm. to a more data data driven and data um, supported process so really uh, you're giving an additional tool and that's how I think of all of this is that you have uh, now a very valid uh, piece of equipment so by by being able to validate the live player tracking and the live ball tracking so that's the standards are in place and that you know a number of providers now optically and with sensors have been able to, to validate you're just offering a lot more pieces of the puzzle for people to build and so I think to, to answer your question, our main focus is here. Um, of course, uh, we, we're looking at different different opportunities, but you do need that kind of uh, question to come in that, that that sort of need. And I think you, you've touched on um, the fans, if they're demanding it, and if you find a, a meaningful way of bringing it in, then of course, that that's something that you will be looked at. Uh, again, I'm not in the business of sort of pushing ideas out there and seeing if they stick on the wall. Um, but there are, there are, of course, a number of other applications. And I think what we can do by showcasing that it works at that level for the most critical of users in that case officiating i mean we're making you know decisions on whether or not goals are scored and stand which which can have massive impact then they're surely good enough for other applications and i think that that's um that's exactly what the way i see it is that we're basically giving every league every competition organizer every club the this technology as a proven uh, way forward to use it in whatever matter they they see to address their own needs and issues. Yeah, I suppose, you know, data is an interesting thing in, in football, isn't it, Maximilian, with the fact that it is it is the, the currency for behind the scenes, for, for teams to be able to plan their, their victories and their, their development. But also there is that demand on the other side, the users, the fans, um, to get even more and more and more. So how are you finding that that balance between the demands of the the players and the teams and the organizations to the to the fans and, and striking that right balance i suppose you've got you're being pulled in all sorts of different directions which is great for you i suppose it's great and it's a challenge at the yeah. same time because we you need to understand what are the requirements of the uh, quality of the data and yeah. the availability of the data and this might be different for a coach than to a, to a fan yeah. and uh, the ideal is that you ultimately have one data set that is good enough to solve um, many many stakeholders uh, interests because you want to have it comparable you don't want to have like fans looking at uh, shot speed on target and seeing Kevin De Bruyne shooting 120 kilometers per hour and that was the hardest shot of the game and maybe the hardest shot of him during the last season and then the, the teams use a different system and they have a different metric so that yeah. that is what you try to avoid so we try to come up with uh, a solution that would be capable of solving all those needs having this one unified data set mm -hmm. by connecting it uh, to, to event data to scouting data ideally that is uh, orchestrated by um, by the league um, because they control the competition or in, in, in case of fifa the federation uh, they control the, the competition of, of a world cup and then you going from there and having this unified data set, you pick like applications that are relevant. And, uh, and then you have experts, right? We have experts internally that focus more on a sports science and the match analysis perspective. 
So we, we create the same kind of data set, different applications on ball control, pitch control, ball handling, ball speed, which is more relevant uh, for, for the coaching side. And then you have like a team that's dedicated more on the fan engagement side. And ideally you link that, right? You, uh, you link that. And if we have a free kick and they look at the free kick, and we look at the spin rate or uh, how stable the, the flight curve is. Ideally that's relevant for the coach and for the, uh, for the fans. And then the true value evolves for a league and a club to say, okay, now we have this one data set and we're building the bridge because the way the coaches speak and what they train and what they communicate to the players and to the team is not so far away from what the players think. And uh, that's, that's an ongoing learning process uh, that we are on, uh, but uh, we're getting closer to that. And uh, with a lot of conversations with practitioners, practitioners in the market uh, that, uh, that, that want to um, merge those data sets to have like a unique uh, data set with one language that we all talking about the same metrics, the same standards. And then from there off, we find different valuable applications. And because then it sticks, right? Because if you as a commentator ask uh, in the post-match interview uh, a player uh, and, and confront him with the statistics, <laughs> ideally, it's not only something for the fans. Ideally, the player also says, yeah, this is a relevant question. And I'm not saying I hey, don't go away with the fan engagement question. Uh, football performance is, so, is about something else. So building the bridge about what's relevant for uh, successful execution on the pitch and, and how, how fans read uh, the game and, and, and observe it and, 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 and perceive the storytelling of what we present to them. Ideally, there is like an alignment. Nicholas, I wanted to come on to the, the, the point that I mentioned a, a little bit earlier on. The fact that, yes, we have a, a Qatar World Cup, which is, which is in a different position not in a in a in a summer traditional summer position um i suppose it, it's advantageous in a way that we now have a, you know a world cup it's going to be tested out it's going to have the eyes of the world all over it including all the top leagues and it almost gives them a chance to go yeah we like it we might even roll it out for the following for the following season i mean what what is the process at the moment in terms of leagues um that are interested that that I'm sure they, they will all wait and see, but I presume it's already sort of the wheels are in motion. Things happen behind the scenes as well, right? Well, the smart, the smart money is on waiting and see. <laughs> um, no, look, I mean, uh, the, the, the business is small enough that, that people are aware and we haven't made a secret of this. I think whenever we've, we've done testing, we've tried to um, uh, onboard them. So I said as, as, as early as 2019, when we, when we asked the question, can we use this new data uh, informed uh, source or can we use data as a source to, to inform officiating decisions we, we had the uh, key football stakeholders at the table um some might have believed it some some wouldn't have so we we haven't done this on our own we, we we've moved forward and of course one of our major missions and again coming back to my very early introduction of the standards is that this has to be universally um applicable but i i'll, I'll take it back to the point of saying so and any any league that would want to use this um will be able to do so. So we, that's why we test all these individual components. As I said we've tested the ball with sensors inside, but there's also optical balls that are tested. So there the, the will be numerous combinations, whether you want to use the ball, whether you want to use a specific provider that we're working with or, or others, they will all have the possibility to follow that, that test um, um, sort of requirement and, and go forward. Um, but equally, it would be possible for someone who says, look, I've come up with a censored ball. I don't believe in, in, in offsides and this and that, that we only use it for a different purpose. So that's exactly what I mean with the little puzzle pieces that we're kind of offering that, that tech stack out there. And I think that the bigger challenge for, for any other league or club is to actually think about what they want. Um, so I, I wouldn't go out there and just say, encourage, copy and, and do what we're doing. Uh, I said, we've, we've come with a very uh, purposeful agenda. Um, and, you know, we, we do 64 games in a very, very high profile that might be very different from the 400 games over a season, uh, mm -hmm. you know, over a two, three pe um, year period. So that, that's the that's the point. But we, we are obviously making it one of our priorities that anyone who wants to uh, take advantage of this ball technology can do so. And I think the last point on that is that what, one of the big missions that we have here, which is the leverage technology or harness technology, but at all levels is also that we want to take the learnings from what we've got here and see how that can be applied um, down, down the football pyramid. Now, what that looks like, well, it's simple. We don't know. We don't know what we don't know, um, but that's where we're having the data uh, will, will help us uh, identify this, uh, this over time. Um, obviously, you know, whether, whether you can put 
simpler electronics inside a ball, whether the optical systems get better, all of that, all of that will come forward. But the, the short answer to what you've asked is yes, everyone who will be keen on using connected ball technology or just better optical ball tracking will be able to do so um, as a consequence of the, the standards that have been put in place or will be put in place by them. So that's that's the you know the adoption for for leagues you know as a trickle down from from the federation FIFA, Maximilian. From your point of view, if if people would just simply like like the clubs that you mentioned by Leverkusen, for example, if there are clubs that are watching, is it is it quite easy for a you know a, a trial almost to be to be set up for for you to have a, a partnership on the back end with a with a with a club? Is is that is that possible as well? Absolutely, it's possible and it's already happening. So yeah. we currently have, um, for clubs, it's uh, it's something that we we offer them like a, a mobile demonstration in one of their practices, for example. That's that's how, in general, our engagement works. And we come with our sports scientists to their site and then they then they engage. They have questions, what they like to analyze, what they, what it's what is their main interest, and we come, we showcase and. Uh, then ideally we find like a common denominator uh, on, on how that ought to implement that. Uh, on a club level, that can be done within a couple of weeks. Uh, it's rather easy. League-wide, it takes a bit longer time because you're integrating the system into, uh, into broadcasting, into what you have for event data, for your social media platforms. But also here, I think, uh, as Nicholas said, a couple of those things are in the process and uh, some of those conversations are confidential and it's probably not the right time to, to announce it uh, here in the webinar, uh, but there are things that are public. For example, that Liga Portugal, uh, they use uh, a connected ball during their playoffs in May uh, in two matches and, 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 and try to learn how they can use it. They integrated it very fast into their broadcasting. They've done social media cards uh, to see to get the feedback from the fans and now evolve what Nicholas said, like understanding truly what they want and then going to the next step. Or, for example, the DFL, the German Bundesliga, and they're hosting like a sports innovation summit, uh, also in May, uh, where they invite different partners uh, to Düsseldorf and showcase technology. And we showcased the connected ball and the live tracking capabilities for fan engagement also at that uh, opportunity. So leagues are already engaging. There's always the opportunity to, to engage and, and explore. And ideally, um, then you find uh, like uh, a use case that, that you want to kick it off. One other thing I wanted to ask you, Maximilian, is, and I, I'll put this to, to Nicholas as well, I'll let you have a little bit of time to think, Nicholas, on this, that if you, and you mentioned it before about the the ways that the players are, they've almost changed the way that they approach the game by absorbing all this data and it becomes something that, that drives them in terms of their own performance. Do you think that this has the potential to almost change the game as well in terms of, what players are trying to do with the ball, trying to manipulate the ball, trying to spin the ball even more, and for that to become another competitive element of the game, that they will start to, you know, you know how much they drill down into their own data. If they're able to say, well, no, I spin the ball, I've, I've, I can spin the ball better than anyone else in the world. I mean, it's not to the, it's not a cricketing thing, obviously, but it's, you know, they will, they will want to do that. It has the potential to, to really shift the game in a, in a fantastical futuristic direction doesn't it it has and it already is happening in a way that's why the technologies are used also in practice because if you want to change the way how you kick the ball you have to analyze it in practice so mm. uh, we don't know about the speed and, and how much it uh, will evolve um, in in what leagues at what timing but uh, we already see that players are more and more interested in these kind of technologies to work on, on, on their performance uh, when we started back in 2014 normally it was like we went to a club and then the coach says hey players now we're using that and the players just nodded and just did what the coach was asking for but they didn't really care today we go to a team or to a club no matter whether it's in, in football or handball or basketball the players are way more aware of what's going on they really want to understand they also want to understand what's done with the data they also claim certain ownership about the, that information so there is a change already happening in the perspective like how players um, are more like entrepreneurs and see their career as also their journey and that's why they will think about that how i can use it in practice 
how I use it to evolve my game. And therefore, our technology has to be available in practice also, because you cannot only practice in a game. In the game, you have to execute practice you do it during the week. Um, so that is already happening, and I'm very confident that it comes to that point. And uh, there will be applications in the next years where the kids in, in academies will try things out. Uh, mm. and, and that is how things work normally. You try out, you learn, and then also like solutions will evolve to that direction, right? It becomes something like you're playing with the ball and you, you're getting insights that you care about, like how many touches you have to practice, how many passes, how fast you pass, how fast you can control the ball still while dribbling and those things. And maybe even you share that with the community, right? You, you challenge your, your friends who are in another club and say, hey, this mm -hmm. is how I train today. So there's a lot of things that will happen in the future, uh, but it's also like we don't know exactly what speed, but this development is, is happening. And just a quick word as well on the on the sort of the AI, the VR side of things as well. I mean, does this this does this help almost with? Yes, it, it's not necessarily on the grass for for people training together as a team, but th this has all sorts of different opportunities in terms of people playing football with each other that aren't in the, in the same place. I suppose whether that's on a, on a game or or actually physically doing it themselves. Yeah, and, and, and here there are a lot of companies working on those things already. Like you have um, AR Googles that you that you might have as a fan and, and observe a game in the arena and, and, and get like all those information visually in, on site. You don't have to look at your smartphone, but you actually get the information right on your AR Google. So that's some, an application that, that, that will happen. You have VR applications where people who, players are, that are injured, use that kind of data to cognitively learn those situations like how fast the game normally is moving while I'm not allowed to be on the pitch right now but I'm, I'm replicating that experience that I still have the mindset for that speed and for that kind of applications you use uh, real data to get it more realistic uh, and that is already uh, also happening and not, not only by us right there's a couple of uh, technology partners out there that that work on those processes and there are a lot of collaborations with teams clubs leagues uh, to evolve that also nicholas and the team there probably have uh, an understanding of the global landscape what's already possible yeah i imagine nicholas in in a lab with with test tubes and uh, screens and things just thinking out about the the, the next fantastical <laughs> development that's going to happen but uh, a final point that's maybe for another webinar um a final point from you nicholas just to to almost sum up this this situation do you feel like are you excited when you think about this this development and and what it what it may mean for the game as the as the you know the standard bearers for for the development of the game? That's a very tricky question to ask. Yeah. No, I mean qualified it, excitement. No, no the, the the thing is, you know, there's there's obviously the emotional side of it in terms of you know are, are we are we trying to move it better, um, make make the game better, move it forward, um, and there's the more rational thing is like are we going to solve some of some of the issues? So. Um, look, I, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if we didn't believe it was the right way. And again, um, I think we can only be uh, underestimated the amount of effort that's gone into in, in our specific use case, getting us to, to where we're going. I think that, you know, on, on the whole point of uh, and, and use the right word, it has massive potential. Now, does that potential materialize? That That's to be seen. Uh, all of these things that you mentioned is, I mean, that's been around, let's say, conceptually for the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, maybe five on them in that sense will be our work that depends on do you find a customer who's willing to pay for it ultimately that that's kind of where where we'll go i think if i can just use a, a an example on, on on the players um we'll know more once we have bigger data sets so let's take a world cup let's take um trainings as a club you might be able to find patterns in free kicks what way of striking a ball has a higher percentage of uh, uh, of the probability of, uh, of success, um, you know, that, that then leads into all sorts of uh, in, interesting engineering conversations around uh, what boot should you be wearing with what ball on what surface mm. should you be playing. So I, I think you, um, you can open up that kind of worms. Um, that's probably in a, in a way exciting. On the other hand, do you want to over engineer the, uh, the process uh, is kind of kind of the balance here. The one point that I will make where I believe that you can definitely benefit from it is that we don't really know much about the ball and I think what it will allow you to do is, is also uh, give um, quantify uh, does that work quantify the quality of certain things so also in, in training looking at touches 
you know you can tell a good touch from a bad touch potentially from from the way the ball is there you can uh, you can understand why a long pass was a good pass versus why it didn't get to where it was going mm. and i think there's a lot of uh, a lot of elements in there that, that should help us uh, get insights now again i'm i I'm not the one asking the questions here. So, you know, it's going to be sort of a collective effort uh, for people to better understand it. But I think you you started off correctly by saying, surely fans will be excited about that. And that, that's the journey that I'm also excited about is to see how we can collectively improve our understanding of the game um, through this and how this data can help us. You know, ultimately, the teams make the game more exciting and the fan maybe also understand and have a uh, sort of a tolerance for frustration in, in a way uh, if, if a game is is playing out nil nil but tactically very enticing we can say look the ball data is however suggesting something to us that, that that's not there so as said i think it has a lot of potential and for sure you know because it's valid and because we've done the research behind it and because we're you know the, these technologies are improving magnificently something that we didn't necessarily anticipate even five years ago it has the potential because it's accurate data to give us those insights. And I think that that's the key for me that makes me uh, uh, very optimistic that we can that we can get something more from this. Just to point out to, to people watching this this webinar, um, you know, some of those questions that I've asked of, of Maximilian and, and, and Nicholas as well have come from the Premier Sports Network partners and they wanted to know more about, you know, fan engagement, for example, you know, uh, AR and uh, AI and and VR and, and things like that. So it's been great to put your questions to these guys um, as well. And obviously, if there is any links that you would like to develop with Connexon, with, with FIFA as well, that can also be managed by Premier Sports Network. That is the advantage of this networking platform. Um, I really appreciate Maximilian and, and Nicholas for, for coming on board for this. I found it absolutely fascinating. It's the sort of thing that you would like to, to sit down and, and just dream up what 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 could be next. And I, I'm really looking forward to, to watching the World Cup, uh, to seeing you know that extra layer um, for the officiating side of things, but how much extra data is now gonna be offered uh, by this new technology. Maximilian, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us, Adam. And we are looking forward to the next couple of months where we will see exciting use cases and then also have room for discussions. Yeah, absolutely. And Nicholas, to you as well. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for watching and we'll be back soon uh, with another Premier Sports Network webinar. Cheers.